Thanks to all of you for coming to our serverless in action session. I'm Edward Laureano, PM on the Azure Functions team. Uh, and I'm Jeff Holland. I'm also a PM on the Azure Functions team. And where I'd like to start is just telling some of you how, how real serverless really is right now. Um, we've, been, we've been doing tons of customer calls, traveling, talking to customers, and one big difference, and we're here last year to this year, is how many more customers are using serverless in mission critical scenarios, in true production scenarios. Serverless is really much more mature now, both in terms of what the platform has to offer and the tooling that companies are making real bet on serverless, just to give you all a sense. Last year, I think we fought hard to get five serverless sessions at Build. This year, if you search for serverless, you get 21 sessions, and that doesn't even count the function, Azure function sessions that, that didn't get, um, doesn't get covered into those. But, so what, what we'd like to do today, um, because it is real and our key differentiator in Azure is really the development experience. We keep getting reassured by our customers that the reason they use serverless, there's tons of benefits, but the main one is how easy it is not only to get started the development, but to maintain your code and maintain your app in production. So we want to keep delivering on that message. For that, we feel like there's a world of offerings on serverless and so many things we can do just in Azure Functions. There's tons of things you can do and scenarios you can support. So we, Jeff and I pulled out some tips and tricks that we thought were going to be useful that you can take away. If you're either starting with Azure Functions or if you've been developing for a while, there's probably something that you can still learn from the platform. So that's what we want to do. Um, and the funny part is we didn't know exactly how we were going to go about the tips and tricks. Um, last year, we, Jeff and I had a session where um, I think the part of inaction was really the highlight. We, we had a, a fake dog spa business that uh, Jeff built this power app that would recognize images of dogs and tell which breed of dog it was and how much it would cost to, to groom the dog. That's right. And I think you were some sort of uh, Yorkshire or something. I, I was a very noble type of dog that I think the personality traits was like, everybody loves this dog and it's fun loving. Right. It's quite right. accurate. It's impressive what machine learning can do. It's, yeah. And it was $20 to groom Jeff. Uh, it's accurate or, or, as well. Yeah. <laughs> And I was a German Shepherd that took five dollars to groom. And I also think the personality cheats were like fussy, a little bit standoffish. Yeah, I yeah. don't know, and I'm not sure because I feel like it would cost more to groom me than you. But anyways, so that was sort of the part, sort of that that part of what was interesting about the session. So this time we came up with something different, nothing to do with the dog spa. So we're gonna go back and forth, dueling on tips and secrets. Jeff picked his favorites. I picked my favorites. And want to do a you know nice healthy uh, duo sure. here? Yeah, nice and healthy. Yeah, I, yeah, and you know I'll comment on yours and see how, how good they are. And um, we elected a panel of judges. Um, yep. But you can explain how we elected. Sure. Them, right? Yes. So if you are lucky enough and you do not have a choice to participate, you are required by your seats, and you are in these first two rows. You are our judges. So we have 13 tips that we have selected today. And I'm going to give the good ones, and Eduardo's going to give some as well. And your job at the, at the end of this is that you pick the tip that you think is the most useful, the most expertly delivered, and you just have to vote with your fingers. And I know I said there's 13, so you have to do some whatever. And whoever wins at the end will know is the true Highlander. I don't know actually what the title is, but uh, so we're going to see what we can do. I think we've got some honestly incredibly useful tips and secrets here, especially the ones I'm doing. <laughs> Um, but before we even get started, we're going to do like the, the crash course on, on serverless uh, in case you've been, you know, not, not around for the last two years on a sabbatical. Sure. Uh, so to start this, I, just from a raise of hands, uh, raise your hand if you have tried building an Azure function before. Yeah, try. Yeah, you don't have to have ex even succeeded. Okay, that's good. So it looks like about 80%. Um, it, that's fine. We'll just start there. OK, so you've probably seen this slide or slides just uh, like it floating around. Really, it's about how with serverless, the whole promise and the value proposition that we're driving for is that when you're building applications that need to run in the cloud, 
We don't want you to have to worry about the same types of things that you generally have to worry about when building applications in the cloud. So if you think about this evolution of applications, if I'm building an app on premises, I've got to worry about power outages and hard drive space and the number of CPUs that I've purchased. I might be able to use infrastructure as a service and leverage VMs, uh, but now I still have to make sure that I have the right number of VMs. Platform as a service, there's considerations there too. And kind of serverless is this idea of, I'm just going to give you my code, and I need you to make sure that it executes successfully. I might send one event. I might send 10 million of events. I don't want to have to worry about that. I just want to write my code. So the pillars of serverless, the first is this abstraction of servers. You're no longer burdened with patching, securing, maintaining, and scaling servers. You're just in charge of your application. Your whole mind is focused on your code and the value that it's delivering. Now for that to work though, behind the scenes, our team has to make sure that we're spinning up resources for you on demand. If you have a purchase order that comes in, we need to make sure that your code has a machine to run on. Yes, we know there are servers that power serverless. Now, that means it does need to be event-driven, though. There needs to be some event, some notification, some change in state to let us know to run your code. And then the last pillar is micro-billing. One of the great things here is that if your code only runs one time, you're only paid, you only, I'm sorry, we're only paid, you're only charged <laughs> for the duration that your function is actually running. So there's a lot of benefits here, and Adrado already focused in on the big one that we hear the most from our customers, which is with serverless technology, I can now get applications shipped and running in production in a fraction of the time that I was able to before. Now in Azure, we actually are very proud of our serverless platform because we understand that serverless is much more than just code. And so that's why in Azure, there's also some other key pillars here. We're not going to have as much time to focus on them today in this session, but there's also Azure Logic Apps, which is serverless workflows. Uh, that's where you can chain different events or connectors together. And Azure Event Grid, which is a newer offering, just announced a few months ago, generally available since January, that actually allows you to route events from different components in Azure or your application to your serverless app. And what's great is that you get these pieces, but it's built on top of a very rich platform. We understand your application's probably going to need data, so we provide rich integration with services like Cosmos DB. You might be using things like IoT or analytics. Intelligence, I love the cognitive services because I am not a data scientist. I don't understand how to build those models, but with Azure Cognitive Services and things like the custom vision service that you saw yesterday, I can now build some pretty impressive things uh, with the skill set that I do have. So all of this sits on top of your code, on top of your application, to give you some powerful functionality. And the other piece here that we're really proud of, uh, and have even been recognized by many analysts, is having incredible development tooling. That's really credit to the foundation that Microsoft's kind of built on with Visual Studio and now Visual Studio Code. Being able to write these serverless apps using those tools, leveraging things like VSTS for continuous deployment, getting rich monitoring. These are all things that you don't really think about until you need them, but once you need them, they make a massive difference, uh, and they're all components that we have in serverless here in Azure. So with that, Eduardo, I don't know if there's any points that you want to necessarily reemphasize or that I missed, or should we get going right into the tips? Uh, I think you did beautiful. I, Thank you. Yeah, I'll criticize your tips, but this is <laughs> So let's start. So judges, you are now critiquing. Just pick your best tip. Let's see what we've got. So our purpose here is now you might want to build your first Azure function or your 500th Azure function. Here are some things that are going to help you along the way, especially things that we see a lot of customers find value of or trip up on. Let's get started. Um, number one, and, and I faced this problem, was um, a lot of our customers, they love the portal, and it's a very nice and easy getting started experience, but once you start doing a lot of functions, just developing locally makes, makes a lot of sense, and it's, you know, it's going to be where you can do your local debugging, and you can do all your development before you ship it to the cloud. For that, if you're using functions, you need to install the functions core tools. In the past, um, uh, it used to be painful, let's say if you're a .NET person, you had to do an NPM install, and then you have to bring Node, and, and it wasn't as easy to install your tools, so thanks to some PMs on the team, uh, we helped like, uh, drive sort of uh, additional easy installations. So if you're on a Mac platform, you can use Brew, which would be native to you. If you're on Linux, you can use AppGet, and you can use Chocolatey on Windows that makes it easier than um, the only options we had before. So, so it's just 
practical way that when you get started installing your tools, those should make it much easier for you. Number one tip. It's no, good. It's, it's, I, it's, I, got, I honestly got nothing on this one. This one's pretty it's, good. It's, it's an average tip. Um, OK. So number two is uh, the question that we, we get all the time, and I was on the Expo floor and got it, which is, which code editor should I use? Because uh, tons of options we have. So let me just do a quick uh, recap on, on the options we have, just to show you. Most of you created the function be functions before. This is going to be a quick recap, and then I'll tell you, give some guidance on which editor to use after I show them. So here's the Azure portal. Uh, I have a function apps that I created. By the way, I put some Easter eggs in there. I don't know if you're going to notice on, on mm. which tips mm. are, are interesting. Um, it's an interesting function name that you've created there, yeah, Eduardo. Um, so you have all your templates here um, for your languages, and you can create your function. So you have uh, templates that help you create a function, for instance, that talks to Event Grid or Event Hub, uh, Cosmos DB, et cetera, and makes it very easy for you to, to get started. So the portal, the portal is nice. One thing I should say is if you pick C Sharp, this is going to be C Sharp script. So what's going to happen here is that the, we are going to compile the code that you added here on the portal. And you always have to keep uh, the, code, the platform needs to be aware of your code. Um, that means the platform does a few extra steps. So and, and if you're really looking for efficient scalability, you might want to avoid the extra compilation step that we have to do for you. So this is just the standard uh, hello world um, that you've probably seen before uh, on functions. Um, if I access it here, I can say hello. Actually, I have to pass a name. You've probably seen this in some other demos. Uh, you can say hello to Jeff. Uh, and I'll go now to Visual Studio Code. It's just to show how these experiences are similar. So in Visual Studio Code, once you have functions, you can install the Azure Functions extension that you can see uh, on, th on the bottom left. And that gives you some nice little commands. So you can start a new project, you can deploy to a function app, or you can create a function. In the same way that you did in the portal, you can pick one of the templates. So you can pick HTTP trigger, or you, you can select the name for your function, the namespace, uh, the authentication level, and that will get your, your function started. And the good thing about code is you're starting locally. You, don't, you could be completely offline even. And, and you can start debugging, debugging this function right away. Go F5. Um, and what that's going to do is uh, I talked about the core tools. So it's going to run the core tools um, here, where it's going to start the host locally so you can test out this function. So the same experience, I'm not going to show all of them. You can do from the, from the command line as well, the command line tool. So you see this nice SQR to the function logo. It means that you have the host. And you get your, your local, local endpoint. Put it on the same place just to show that uh, it's working. Um, and the same thing here. And I can pass in a name. Um, um, and that works as well. I can set up a breakpoint, and that would stop on your breakpoint. Now, just for some of you that haven't created functions in different ways, there is also Visual Studio that you could create your function. You can click here, and you can do um, when you do add on your project, you can add a function as well. That will be same idea, the same templates. The way we do it internally is we have a way that our platform publishes templates, so all the different clients can consume them um, in a unified way. And I'll. I want to finish this one. I want to go back to, to tell you when to use which one, because I think that's, that's a real tip here. And, and here's a little bit of guidance. So, so if you're on the portal, again, keep in mind that if you're a .NET developer, that's going to be C Sharp script. In Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio is the class library, so if you're doing tons of functions and you're deploying scalability performs a concern, that would be recommended for .NET. Um, Visual Studio Code, obviously, if you're running on, on a Linux or a Mac, you have that available there. Um, and we even integrate with other tools. If you're a Java developer, and Java is on preview right now, but we integrate with, it with IntelliJ, which is the most popular uh, IDE for Java. Uh, but you know, if you're, if you're the kind of person that you know, listens to 
vinyl playing while you code and you're like traditional, um, you might want to use just Notepad, Notepad++ with the Functions Core editor. So you can pick the editor of your choice, sorry, Functions Core tools, um, if none of these other editors work for you. But there are some of the recommendations based on the features that you want to use is in there. The one thing I'll mention here too, and you might have caught it, uh, and I think a lot of people get stuck on this, because if you're like a C-sharp developer or an F-sharp developer, and you start writing your Azure function in the Azure portal, and the experience we give you by default are these C-sharp scripts. And so you start looking around, and you're like, well, how do I install NuGet packages? How do I reference classes that are in other files? How do I have shared or portable class libraries? And that's all very difficult because it is, in fact, a C-sharp script. So we, we don't actually have your compiled bits until you run your function. And that's when we compile your function into compiled binaries and run it. And so it's great for getting started. It's fine for some scenarios. But I would say the best experience, especially for C-sharp and F-sharp, is actually starting with one of those local tools that Eduardo showed you with Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio. Because in those worlds, you create a C-sharp program just like you would any other, a console app or a web API. And when you're finished building it, you, you do the build step. You say, like, file build. And it actually builds the binaries. And that's what you publish. Uh, so it gives you all the flexibility to reference other libraries, pull in NuGet packages, do whatever you might want to do. Uh, so I think some people see a demo of the portal, and they start with the portal, and then they hit a wall, and they're like, well, shoot, I guess Functions is pretty limited, uh, where they might just have a better experience just by using a different editor like Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. Uh, OK, so number three, simplify your code with triggers and bindings. So triggers you are likely familiar with. We've already kind of talked about this some. This is the event that's going to start your function. This could be I've added a new file into blob storage. A new message is on some queue ready to be processed. Uh, I have someone who's hit this HTTP endpoint. That's all pretty common. The one that is less known is this concept in Azure Functions called bindings. And bindings actually allow you to pull data in or push data out to different sources without having to write the code to do so. So I have here a list. These are our popular triggers from our data right now. But it also, these also have bindings as well. So you can think of it in that I might have an API that has an HTTP trigger. Like, I want to fire this function when somebody hits an API. So it's going to have an HTTP endpoint. But in that function, I might need to pull in data from Cosmos DB, or maybe write a document to Cosmos DB, or to storage, or to a queue, whatever, any of these things. And I could, very validly so, install the SDK for Cosmos DB, figure out how to pull in a document from Cosmos DB, or push out a document to Cosmos DB. That's all valid and fine, but you don't have to. And bindings provide a way for you to very simply write a little bit of a hint to the function runtime to let it know, hey, I want to integrate with Cosmos. And instead of having to write the eight lines of code you would for Cosmos, we actually manage that connection to the Cosmos database. And we can actually reuse those connections across executions. So bindings can be a really helpful piece when they come in handy. Now, they manifest themselves in a few different ways. Uh, I have here some of the main languages. So if you're using like C Sharp in Visual Studio, you're writing attributes on your C Sharp method. And if you're, you're familiar with writing like web APIs, this is pretty familiar. It's the same way that I would describe like a route or a from body uh, parameter. Here you would specify that a specific parameter is a binding. So here I'm saying the string text file should actually be a file pulled from this blob, this specific blob here, right? And so when this function triggers, that text file variable will be enriched with that blob data. Now, if you're using JavaScript or C Sharp script or Python, one of these scripting languages, uh, because there isn't a way for us to use these attributes, we give you this function.json file where you describe the name of the variable and the type of binding that you want. And in Java, we do have at attributes. So similar concept to C Sharp, but in Java, they're at attributes. So you can do the same kind of stuff. There's pretty good documentation on these triggers and bindings, but I want to show you one of those now. So and, I'm here. Uh, oh, to, go for to it. To add one thing, like, uh, and where the magic really happens, and that's unique to, to our offering in terms of, uh, of functions, is mapping from the binding to your type. Either this case was pretty simple as a string, but if you have a rich type, the serialization, deserialization, this type, we do in the platform for you. So that's where the magic happens. It prevents you from having to work with more complex type or including an SDK because we do all this 
marshalling marshalling of the data into your own types. So That's right. Good it's call very out. Very powerful. Okay, so I've just gone into Visual Studio and I've said to add a new function to this project. And right here at the splash screen, you will see a few different services. Like I have Blob here, I have HTTP, I have Q, but this isn't comprehensive. So the first thing to know is this isn't a comprehensive list. There's actually more here that you might not be seeing. Uh, and we'll skip the runtime selector up here for now. Uh, but what I actually am going to do, I'm just going to start with an empty function app. And yes, I want to trust all of these sources. Uh, and let's go ahead now and just recreate the one Eduardo showed you, which is a simple Azure function, which will start whenever it receives an HTTP request. So here's another set. This one's got a little bit more templates. This is the standard templates that Eduardo was talking about. Let's just stick with HTTP for now, but I could obviously do a bunch of these other ones. Now, let's say for my example, you saw Eduardo, he passed in a name, it returned a value. Maybe I want to store all of these requests. In fact, I have here in my subscription, this is a Cosmos DB account that I've already set up. I have this collection called function and this uh, document library, I probably mixed those up, called function. And I want to keep a record of anyone who uses my API. So I want to store some data in Cosmos. So I've gone ahead now and let's say I've looked at the documentation and I've learned that attribute that I need to talk to Cosmos DB. For the sake of time, I'm just going to paste that in here. So this here is the attribute in my code. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to paste that in again. This is the attribute in my code that I now need to use to call this function. Oh, I know why this is doing this. I'm sorry. I'm demoing from this machine that is you not very happy fast. with me. Okay, I did that. Yeah, this was uh, uh, auto hotkey this time. Uh, so here I've got an attribute. I'm saying use Cosmos DB. I'll zoom in here. I was trying to zoom in before when it wasn't working, so I'll just manually zoom in. Use Cosmos DB, and I've even specified a few things, like the database is called function, the collection is called function. Here I have a connection string setting, I'll talk about this in a second, called doc Cosmos DB connection. And I'm saying whatever I set for this docs parameter, which is an out parameter, that's what I want you to store on Cosmos DB. Okay? So I haven't had to write anything with Cosmos DB, I just write this attribute, specify it with the configuration that I need. Let's go ahead here and zoom out. And to make this work, let's take the request body and just set that variable to the request body. Okay? So what this is going to do now is whatever my request body was for that HTTP request, it's going to set that in that special variable that I specified as my Cosmos DB one, and it will store that in Cosmos DB. So that's how I write a binding. But you probably notice that I have some red lines here, and they're probably driving some of you crazy, because you're like, what is wrong with this code, and why does it have red lines? And in fact, I can come up here, and I can try to resolve it, but I actually don't have anything super helpful up here. Nothing here that's going to help me. So this is my next part of the tip of using extensions and bindings. And this is an important thing to note, especially if you're using our preview runtime, the runtime that uses .NET Core 2.0. And that's because to make our runtime as agile and as performant as possible, we actually remove a lot of those triggers and bindings from the base image itself. Because if your function isn't doing anything with event hubs or event grid or Cosmos DB, we really don't want to have to load up all that SDK into memory because it's going to slow down your function. So we don't pull those in by default. Now what that means though, and what's not super obvious right now, is that if I want to use something like Cosmos DB, I do need to make sure that I pull in that extension. The experience is a little bit different for different languages, but C Sharp is the one I'm going to focus on for here. I would need to know that these are some of the extension names there. This is a few of the top ones here. Um, and we're working right now, I'll mention, I don't have anything to show you right now, but we're working with the tooling teams with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code so that if I see one of those red squiggly lines, hopefully we'll just assist you in downloading the right extension. So go ahead to, to fix my code so that the red squiggles aren't driving too many people too crazy. What I do want to open here is my uh, NuGet package manager. Let me make sure I'm selecting this project. And now... Let's go ahead and install that NuGet package, okay? So now I'm saying in my Azure Function project, I want the Cosmos DB thing. And when I press Enter, it's now going to pull that extension into my Function project, and in just a second, you should see those red squiggly lines go away, okay? So that's another big tip. A lot of people get confused on why their triggers or bindings aren't working when using the version 2 preview runtime. Make sure you're aware that you might need to pull in those extensions. 
OK, we'll leave it there for now, because that still doesn't work. So I'll have to do the last part for this next tip. All right, so here's tip number four, leveraging environment variables. Uh, Oh, yes, OK. So environment variables, if you're not familiar, these are variables, obviously, specific to a specific environment. So if I have my local development, it's very possible that there's some settings I want to be different than in my cloud environment. I think the most basic example of this for a functions user would be like a storage account. I might have the Azure storage emulator running on my laptop. So when I'm running this function locally, I just want it to use the storage emulator on my laptop. But when I publish it to the cloud, I obviously can't be using the storage emulator on my laptop. It can't connect to it. So I actually need to make that an environment variable so in the cloud, it connects to a different database than on my machine. Now, environment variables uh, locally are on your machine. And some environment variables are always environment variables. So connection strings. If you recall from when you saw my code a second ago when it said Cosmos DB connection string setting, I didn't have a really long connection string. I had the name of an environment variable. That's because we don't really want people pasting connection strings into their source code. It's, a not, it's, a not, it's not a good place for secrets to live. And so we want your secrets to live in your environment variables. And your code just references those environment variables. That way you can check it into source control. You can do all the things that you want to do when dealing with secrets. So to make it easy for you to use environment variables, we give you this file when you're building Azure Functions locally called the local.settings.json file. Every project has one. And this is just a really quick way for you to set environment variables when building locally. Now, when you publish and run in the cloud, these environment variables are called application settings. So if you're ever looking at an Azure function in the Azure portal, there's a big section for application settings. Those are your environment variables for the cloud. And one important tip that a lot of people miss is they'll get everything working locally. They'll publish their function app to the cloud, but they won't go and set their environment variables in the cloud. So now their function wakes up. It tries to figure out what Cosmos DB database do I connect to. It doesn't see an application setting in the cloud, because you only have it in your local.settings.json, and things don't work. Again, this is another tip that we're doing improvements on so that when you do like a publish from Visual Studio, we want to give you a merge experience so that we're like, hey, by the way, you have some environment variables that are missing or are different. Do you want to update any of these? Uh, but for now, probably the, a nice little tip is the Azure Functions Core Tools does have this nifty CLI command that you can actually run, and it will do that merge uh, uh, of your app settings there. So to show you this, and just to finish out my sample with Cosmos DB, so if you remember, I've got this uh, connection string setting. And so my environment variable is called Cosmos DB connection. And if I open my local.settings.json, you'll see that I actually have two environment variables that are already preset for me. These are both for my storage account. And I am, in fact, using my cloud or my local storage emulator on my device. And so if I now want to connect to Cosmos DB, I just need to add that environment variable for, let me get this one right, Cosmos DB connection. And it is this really long, nasty connection string, which I don't want to have to type. So let's paste that into. Do, 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 do. That's an actual connection string, which if you're looking at the video stream, hopefully I've deleted this account by the time you're watching this. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now this will actually work. So when this function starts to run and it says, what's the Cosmos DB connection, this will set that environment variable. So let's go ahead and run this now just to show it off. I've used that binding. I've connected to Cosmos DB. I didn't have to write any SDK code to Cosmos DB. I created that attribute. I made sure I set the environment variable. So now let's run this locally. I'm going to send in the payload. Name is Jeff. We'll click Send. It comes back. And it's happy. I don't see any errors. In fact, if I come back here to Cosmos DB, you'll see I have a new document here, which was just created. And here I have stored that request body. So I was able to integrate with Cosmos DB very quickly just by using those bindings. So it's a tip that not a lot of people know about. It can save you a lot of time when you're doing simple inputs and outputs. And I could have had this be an input binding. So maybe I wanted to look at a query parameter and pull a document by ID. I could have also done that type of a binding as well. So there's more documents there on docs.microsoft.com, but that's the tip that we wanted to share. So with that, Eduardo, let's see if you can top that, buddy. Man. <laughs> OK. Let's see what we can do. Um, 
I'll start a tip that's actually very simple. Much, many fewer steps than the one Jeff did. But uh, <laughs> one problem um, we typically see people doing is functions very commonly used for you to do your web APIs. And, and your web APIs typically are developed um, when you have a, a big organization or tons of developers. Different parts of your APIs are developed by different teams. And the consumers of your APIs might be people in a different room in your company or, or external people as well. So in this scenario here, let's say you have a mobile development team that uses a set of APIs. And all of you are the cool back-end developers, and you're developing the API. And you want them to have all a single API surface. So you can have part of your API in one function app, and you can have parts of your API in a completely different function app, different set of people working, scaling differently, and connected to a different part of your repository. Um, and you can even have parts of your API that, that's totally powered by a different endpoint. Again, what Prox is going to do for you, it's really normalize all of that into a single surface. Let, let me show you actually how, how this works in practice. Um, it's probably one of the simple, simplest features we have in terms of getting started. So let's say you want to create a new API that you, wanna, you, wanna, you decide on the contract, and you want to give it to, let's say, the mobile development team. Um, this one is for movie reviews, so I created um, a simple API here. And if I just create the route template, it will pick the host name of my function app and append that route template. If my function app has a custom host name, it would be mydomain.com slash, in this case, movie review movie name. And we're just creating this simple proxy. You don't even need to have created any functions whatsoever. Um, this is going to work, and this, this API will respond. Um, do you want to tell me a movie? You, you like a movie? Easy to type. <laughs> Backdraft, I like it. Backdraft. So this is my mock API, right? I could have, um, I have this API. So, so because it's a mock API, it returns the right review for your movie. Uh, minions, in case you didn't see. Minions. <laughs> um, what a bait and switch. I know. And if I do like Avengers, it will return minions. And the, the reason this happens, and this is by design, um, is what I do here is I have this response override because I'm not sending to any actual API. I just paste it in the body here that I want to return. So without, with no lines of code whatsoever, I just had to paste some JSON that I stole from the New York Times review API. Thanks, New York Times. Uh, letting me use your API. Um, and I paste this review here. I could easily replace that and actually point to a backend, which would be the New York Times review API, and that would route those requests to this other external API. Let me show you an example of that that working. And this mocking one can be super useful when you do have like, hey, we need to start in our mobile app at the same time we're building the backend features behind the scenes. And you don't want to have to finish the functions before the mobile app team can start calling an API. So you can really quickly create one of these mocks so that the mobile team can call an API that has a valid contract while you still figure out the stuff behind the scenes. So this one is it's just a neat little fun API that, given a name, it gives you the, your avatar as a robot. Um, so how you would look like a robot is robo-hash. I'll explain how the proxy works in a second. Let's first see it in action. So it's actually going to route to a backend. So let's see Jeff as the, the avatar for Jeff. Um, so here's the background color. I'll set to zero, which is no background. And there are a bunch of different sets of avatars. I'll set it to two. Um, Let's see if this looks like Jeff or not. So this is Jeff's oh, yeah. avatar. Um, that looks just like my high school prom I think photo. It's, I think it's very similar. Oh, yeah, actually. that is. Yeah. The eyes. It's the eyes, really. Yeah. They're, they're offset. Yeah. You'll well, notice my glasses tilt. It's, it's just a funny guy. And then you have a set that you look like a cat. So that's you. Cat. But anyways, not, not the point here. The main point is here's, here's the thing that's cool is that the API that actually you compose is all based on URL path. So you can see I take the name, the color, and the number all in the URL path. Um, but the actual API takes some of those in, as um, query strings. And actually, I'm concatenating BG with color, so the exact um, format that this API takes my request. So I can do fancier manipulation. I can add headers to, to those requests. I can pass in, um, pass in more parameters all through request override. So I can modify either the request before it calls or the response before it, it comes back. And Super, super easy to use um, uh, proxies. 
easier than tip number whatever you had. Um, Three and four. Yeah, OK. So that's proxies. Um, the one, one small announcement, because not worldwide yet, is proxies work in functions v1 runtime. Now it works on v2 runtime as well, um, which start deploying. So on U West US 2 region, if you want to give it a try immediately, maybe right after the session. Um, and it will be soon uh, worldwide. Because if you already have a function app and you're on a route, you don't want to be, you, I don't want you guys to have to mix match v1 at v2. So we want to make proxies available, whichever version of uh, the runtime you're using. So we're releasing that one. OK. Um, here, here's another scenario. And this one will be more um, learning from what our customers are doing. Um, you all probably seen the keynote. There's tons of talks about IoT and ML and the vision of how Microsoft is getting there, how we're building all these solutions. But these are problems that our customers have had to deal with, IoT and ML, on the field for a while. And a lot of it doesn't use some visionary technology. It uses like, concrete solutions that we have today, such as Azure Functions. So let me walk you through what one of our customers is doing. So this is um, Fagor Ederlan. I'm not, saying, not sure if I'm saying their name right. So they're a company from Spain. They manufacture auto parts. And they have mechanical robot arms that will manufacture those parts. And eventually, those arms start failing, start not being as precise. And the parts they're producing might not be good for the auto industry. So they need to detect on that's a problem. This is a node system that they had. Each arm talks to, to a computer that runs some sort of Win32 application, and that cannot be messed with. And it's really old style. It writes every single measurement as a set of CSV files. And that's the setup that they had. That part they could not replace. They could not, out of a sudden, install some more compute on those old mechanical arms. So all they had was those CSV files, and they wanted to add intelligence. They wanted to detect automatically when they're starting to fail. So here's a solution that they built, all with components that we have today. So first, they wrote some, some software to push those files out to IoT Hub. From IoT Hub, they generate for each file an entry on a blob. So just like the sample functions we create here, the triggers on a blob, it would have a function that every time it sees a new blob, it picks it up because it's a new measurement from, from one of those mechanical arms. And would decompress into a more structured format, put in a secondary blob. Then another function knows when a file got dropped, picks them up, and writes those in a structured way, all those measurements uh, that take from, it writes on a characteristics table. Those go to stream analytics that's compared to a model that they already have, so they can do their prediction part of ML. So as you guys probably know, ML, two big steps. One is to predict, the other one is to train the model. So that's the prediction path. So they'll take a measurement, they'll compare against the model, and machine learning will, will push this out to Power BI, and someone can refresh that Power BI dashboard to know, OK, there's some mechanical arms that need attention. They need to be repaired. So that's nice. They'll be able to add like prediction. But they also add, and that's the number three you see there, they added um, functions that are retraining pipeline to retrain the model. What they do is every single measurement that they collect and the output from the model, they feed it back to that model. They pick up some historical data of measurements. They send it to Hadoop, where you see the little elephant there. And they retrain that model and generate a, um, a, new, a new ML model. So not only do they do the measurement part, they do the retraining, all using a lot of its serverless technologies and Azure functions. Um, so we thought that was pretty interesting. But if you're wondering how to achieve that, um, because this is very practical talk, we want to give you advice that you can implement right away, is IoT, a lot of it's about processing events. So you can use IoT Hub, just like that example, push your events to the cloud, or you can use Stream Analytics or Event Grid to connect to your custom events, all sorts of other events. From that point, you can trigger a function to do your compute and your processing. Um, if you want to process things before it hits the cloud, then you, we have IoT Edge as a product that can be installed. And then you can process them with functions as well as a programming model. And only after you process, you can send them to the cloud. Um, on the ML side, a lot of ML, um, uh, I, I actually worked in, in Bing way back and we did a bunch of ML. And 
Most of the ML work that I thought was super fancy, deep neural networks is about preparing the data. It's about cleaning the data, making it structure, removing duplicates. All that needs to happen before you even do an inference and you send to ML model. So functions are great for that, for you to go from unstructured data to structured data to clean up, remove duplicates, and so on. Um, the other thing that's that you can use today is from functions, you can integrate with all these different cognitive services. You can call those services. A lot of them have web endpoints that you can just call from a function. A lot of them are also exposed through logic apps. So you can integrate a lot, you can have a logic app step that calls into one of these different services that does machine learning and then pass on the results to an Azure function. So, so there's a lot of ways you can achieve that today, just like um, this customer achieved it. So, it's, it's, it's in your hands to kind of like make some of these scenarios happen. Awesome, number seven, and thank you, Eduardo, that's great. Now this tip, I actually really, really want to share this tip. In fact, this was the tip that when Eduardo and I talked about this format, that I wanted to share the most because I would say this is the most common mistake that I see people make in their function code that has the easiest fix and makes the most significant difference on how their code executes. In order to explain this tip, I want to explain a little bit about how functions run behind the scenes. I know one of the challenges with serverless and Azure functions is that it can sometimes feel like a black box. Like you give your code and then you just cross your fingers that things work, but you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. For all you know, Eduardo's on a massive hamster wheel somewhere, running as fast as he can, powering all your functions, which is fortunately far from the truth. So what is actually happening is that when your Azure function needs to run, we add an instance. So there is now an instance. We start with one instance that your Azure function can run on. And on that instance, we stick your function app. So you've written your function. I just wrote one in Visual Studio. I'm now trying to call this function, so we'll make sure there's an instance, and we'll put your app on it. Now, once we get an instance, we're not just going to take it away right away. In fact, I think a lot of people in, in our minds when we're using serverless, you kind of think, I have an execution, there's something that's going to pop up, execute, and then vanish into thin air. And another execution comes in and a new thing's going to pop up and execute and vanish into thin air. But the truth is, if you're still executing things in a reasonable amount of time, we don't want to have to recreate instances and reload your code. So we're actually going to keep it around. And we're going to keep it running. Now, you're not charged for us keeping it around. That's just us being nice and also trying to make our life more efficient. Now, the other part here is that you, know, you might have an execution that happens, but these instances actually have like a gig and a half of memory and a core of CPU if we're talking about serverless functions. So it's very possible that your single function instance could actually handle multiple executions at the same time, all on the same instance. If I'm sending like five requests every single second and a single request is very short, it's very possible that all five of those requests are being processed on the same instance at the same time. Now, the reason that I want to share that is because you can actually take advantage of this behavior. Because there are certain things that you might be doing in your function that you may want to only do once, but then share it across multiple executions. And the most common example I see of this is something like the HTTP client, where you're making some HTTP request in your function code. The other one I see very often is like SQL client, event hub client, pretty much anything that has the word client at the end of it. So the code that I see more often than anything else is something just like this, and I hope you can read it, okay? So I have my Azure function code here, and inside my code I see using var client equals new HTTP client, and then I say client.postasync. Now raise your hand if you think there's something wrong with this code. Raise your hand. Everyone raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so this is in fact for a number of reasons an anti-pattern and it is not a very obvious one In fact, if you go into my personal github account and you go to a github repository or one of my repositories from about six months ago You will see that I wrote this exact line of code in one of my Azure functions So this is something that is a very common mistake to make because it feels so right you're like, look, I'm putting things in a using block. I'm going to dispose of my resources. I'm being so responsible. And but it will actually ruin brought things. You, brought you on the team, huh? I know. And I, I didn't mention that during the interviews. Uh, <laughs> OK? So the problem with this model is that every time an execution happens, we create a brand new HTTP client, which we then have to remove. It would almost be like browsing the web. But every time you want to click a link, you close your web browser 
open a brand new web browser, paste the link, go to the link. If you want to go to another one, you close your browser, open a new one. It's going to take forever. It would work, but it's going to take a really long time. So you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck if you share that client across executions. And those might be executions happening at the same time. HTTP client is thread safe. Or they might be executions that happen one after another. But like I said, we're going to keep that instance around for quite a bit of time. So if you want more information, there's an AKA link here, aka.ms slash anti-pattern. There's a whole article about this specific anti-pattern. And the fix is so easy. All I have to do is change that one line of code. And instead of saying using HTTP client, I create a shared HTTP client. Now, when I do it this way with a static variable, that HTTP client will now be reused across multiple executions until we finally tear down that instance. But we keep instances around for a number of minutes right now. So unless you don't have any requests coming in for a while, you're going to be able to reuse that HTTP client. It's going to save you a bunch of time. You're keeping your web browser open. So it's a super simple change, but it makes a massive difference in the resource utilization that your code has. So now, once we create your function instance, you'll create your HTTP client. You can now reuse that client safely over a number of executions, either over time or in parallel. And like I said, this pattern holds true for other things too. So if you need to connect to a SQL database and you're sending 10 requests every second, you don't really want to have to create 10 new connections to your SQL database every second. That's just going to ruin your SQL database. It's going to be really expensive. So instead, you can do a pattern like this. Just create a single connection to your SQL server, one per instance, and we'll be able to reuse it safely. Uh, so in fact, I actually, just to kind of as an example, and I won't show you the code, I wrote an Azure function that did the anti-pattern yesterday. I had it trigger on an event hub. I just wrote a really simple Azure function that was using var client equals new HTTP client. And then I threw 10,000 events at it all at once to see what would happen. Uh, and it didn't really like it <laughs> that much. Uh, so this is a big one. So hopefully that makes sense. It will make a massive difference. And you can use this too even for like a, a very lightweight memory cache. So the other example I've used this in is maybe during my function code, I need to go fetch a secret from something like Azure Key Vault. And instead of having to fetch a secret every single execution, I'll actually create a shared variable, a static variable, fetch the secret once, set it as that static variable, and now subsequent executions on that instance can just reuse the secret that I already got. So I don't have to go fetch that secret every time and hit key vault throttles or whatever else. So a really, really useful pattern. Number seven, if there's one thing you're going to take away and one thing you're going to vote for, my money's on number seven here, OK? All right, Eduardo, you're up. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually debug what's wrong with your anti-pattern <laughs> to see if we find some issues. Um, so before we go there, we, um, and this is brand new stuff, actually. We, we included some functionality to, actually, I'm going to go here for one second. Um, oh, sorry, man. I was trying to be helpful. It's, it's, it's good. Uh, you're trying to get your, your votes up. Um, so <laughs> one thing we've been, we've been doing is trying to help you with your issues in production. Um, you know, some of you might sometimes, rarely, write code that fails in production. And sometimes can be us, can be the platform, too. So, so we need to help you diagnose the nature of functions is you run in all these different instances. And a lot of problems are a little harder than your just standalone code. Some of the problems only happens when you scale or when you're in the cloud. So we want to help you getting to know what's really wrong, either if it's platform issue or if it's your own code issue. So um, web apps had um, web apps diagnostics, which is this UI, and I'll show you guys in a second. So we are leveraging now that for functions. What it does, it has a bunch of pre-created queries for common problems that we can aggregate data from multiple sources and put them all together in a single chart to hopefully help you visualize those problems. Um, let me actually show you one of these guys working here. Um, so I have a function that uh, purposely, um, not super smart, try to really spike up the CPU um, just so we can simulate the, the behavior. So what you can do here, and I'll show the first screen, um, if you click on, on platform features and you click on diagnose issues, you get to this UI. And you have, you have this 
pre-configured uh, analyzers that you can click on on those tiles, and that will give you some analysis. So you could look at scaling issues, like how much you scale your functions, how many machines were, were used, um, and you can do a health checkup. So I was talking about that one spiking up the CPU. So you can see the CPU getting to 90% in several instances, like pretty high. Often, like if the CPU is getting over 60% even on a function, it, it's worth you thinking about how much processing you're doing on a single unit and breaking that down. So, so this builds those charts for you. Memory, CPU invocations, this is on a timer, so it exec executes probably every five minutes, so the invocations in this particular case is not super interesting, but the CPU is. Would help you see, hey, my function seems to be getting in trouble pretty often. Um, give you another example here, uh, nicely named function app. Um, Sad, sad serverless. Um, on this one, when you do a health checkup, it actually looks at the logs and will actually bring the error up to you in, in a single way. Instead of you harvesting all the different executions, look for exceptions, or put them really right, right in your face here. And the same thing with um, out of memory exceptions as well, we'll bring them here. You can either look at, look at those exceptions or you can uh, look at the memory count to see, let me just, uh, bring this back up to fix the chart. Um, you can actually see the memory, let me move down. Like Jeff said, the, mem the execution of a function is up to 1.5 gigabytes, so in this chart here, you'll be able to see how much memory each instance is using, so you can map that to a failing execution. So, it's something we just launched, we're gonna add more tiles, and refine those queries, and, and, and also the graphical interface, some things we wanna, you wanna add, but, um, Give it a spin, uh, see how that works. We want to keep improving your experience diagnosing. Actually, there's a full uh, session um, after this one that goes, goes into more details on, on diagnostics. And the other part that um, goes hand in hand diagnostics is um, a function's performance. If you want to analyze, we have functions as a little monitoring tab that you guys might have seen in the past. Um, that monitoring tab um, we replace now with application insights. It used to be our own monitoring that the functions team wrote. Now we push all that data, machine level data as well as application data, all to App Insights. And App Insights much richer experience, more reliable. It has all the query support, the graphic support. You can sample the data to decide how frequently you want to send those, that telemetry to App Insights. So it gives you much more control, puts the control in your hands regarding telemetry. So because of that, now when you create a function app, and right at the bottom of that create screen, you have a little toggle, now we set that to on. So when you're creating a function app, App Insights is created by default for you, so you don't have to configure that later. Um, and let me show you also that in action. Let me just make this comment first. So one, one concern people had was, hey, App Insights is another product, now I'm using functions, I'm also using this other service, and, and that service is a service that I have to pay for, and if I have too much data, now I'm starting to pay for that. So one thing we've done is on the function side, you have really granular control on what you send to App Insights. You can say the frequency, how many events per second you wanna send, you can say the verboseness level you want, you can say I only wanna send warning and errors, I don't wanna send informative uh, uh, logs to App Insights, you can base it on categories, you can send the host telemetry, you can send only your app telemetry, so it's up to you to choose, and you can choose, you can choose how to send aggregated telemetry as well. So even if you decide to go in a very low sampling rate, you can decide to always send aggregated data, so at least you'd have a sense in the aggregate how things are working. So it's all within your controls, and in App Insights, there's a data sampling rate as well that you choose how much App Insights retain. So even after the data is on the App Insight side, you can decide how much you want to keep, because that's what you're going to be paying for. So it's a good tip if you want to control the costs and control what you send to App Insights. But let me actually show you how to get to App Insights in case you haven't seen it. Um, and actually, I'll start with, um, see if I have it here. I'll start with Jeff, Jeff's function that he had. He, he named his App Insights uh, interesting way. Um, oh, yeah, I did. Jeff so, Eduardo Power Hour. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take a look at it. So he said there were some errors when he executed. App Insights is a bunch of pre-built queries, so we're gonna run uh, one of them. Um, 
said 10,000 executions. So we'll see how many of those executions failed. Uh, this is just a sample query. Uh, almost all of them failed, I guess. And you see that you get a win HTTP exception here, which is directly correlates with the fact that he's trying to, he ran out of number of HTTP clients he could use. Um, and you can do different queries here as well. You can actually get details on the exceptions, so you can just um, run those exceptions here on App Insights. And uh, I don't need that bar. Um, I don't select the query. Okay, so that will return the exceptions. I'm, I'm making no filters here, so if you have too much data, I might take all I can do. Let me do just pick the most recent ones here. Okay, actually came back. So you can get the exceptions and get into more details. So you're gonna have like stack tracing here and a bunch more details on those exceptions. So it could really help you diagnose what's going on just by using App Insights. Another common case that you wanna use App Insights is to analyze performance. So I have another example here um, where typically you have this, this application that's running on a timer and I wanna know how the performance is working. So the typical chart on the monitoring tab, let me show you this, on, on the monitor tab on, on the function, so if you come here, that's what you get on functions that's now powered by App Insights. It's just a standard table that has your most recent results of your function's executions. Um, as the table is powered by App Insights, if you click run in App Insights, you get the same query in App Insights where you have more control and you can customize which data, what part of the data you wanna see. So here's the same query, just running an App Insights, so I can make like something fancier just to know the executions and uh, scroll down a little bit and the duration in milliseconds, so I can group them and know pretty much like a histogram of the durations of each execution, so I can have a sense of what I need to work on. So tons of power, power in App Insights, but we're just making much closer to Azure Functions in general. So. Leverage it if you want to tune your performance or just know what's up with your function app executions. Oh, is this me again? Hey, you, you got the next oh, two. This one is the big, one of the biggest improvements we've yeah. made and one of the, we tried to bring here the common questions you have. How many of you heard of uh, Code Start? Um, I have a slide that I can't use at Build Conference. I typically use a guy running and running from like starting to run and then jumping on a frozen lake and hitting his head, which is what people think cold start is. That's how it feels. I don't know if that's what it is. Here's what a cold start is in case you haven't heard of it. And all serverless compute solutions across cloud providers have this sort of the same, the same issue by nature of serverless. What happens when you do your first execution on a code that's not running and Jeff was talking about instances, we warm up one of those instances. We bring all the code and all the pieces relevant to the functions and the functions runtime and make that, that instance warm and we take them from a pool and make it allocated to you as a customer. Then as a second step, and I'm simplifying a bunch of the steps here, but the major blocks, the second part is to load your code, your dependencies. So your code might bring in binding and binding extensions and if you have um, typical node application, you're gonna have a large NPM tree, so you need to bring that all down to that machine, to that instance, um, and your code runs. So, code start, it's, uh, it's the added latency for the step one and two that you see there. Step three is just a regular latency of your function. So, and what, one thing that we've been really focusing on is how to improve the overall experience there. So a couple of things, um, as tips I wanna give is, one is um, you have to think that code start can happen. No matter how much the platform improved, there's still the possibility if you're running on a consumption plan that code start is gonna happen. So you need to design with that in mind. In functions, um, we also have a dedicated mode, which is just like, app, just like app service, uses an app service plan, where you decide how many instances your functions are going running on and you can set up your auto scale rules and all that. In that mode, you can have that, those instance, instances always warm and you don't hit code start. So that's one. The other one is, especially for, for Node, uh, JavaScript developers, um, is to reduce the number of app dependencies because 
all the amount of I.O. that we have to do to bring all these files to your instance, it's really what caused cold start. But with that in mind, we implemented just a couple months ago this feature called run from zip to improve the amount of I.O. we do. So what we do is we mount a drive with all your files all at once. We bring them all locally. And instead of doing one I.O. for each file, we just have a mounted drive with everything your app needs. And that gives us a real nice boost uh, in performance on those scenarios. And that's the one I, um, I want to show you. And it's important to note, too, I know it's, it's likely uh, obvious to many of you. I've talked to a few people who are afraid that with serverless, you get cold start on every request. Uh, and it's important to, dis to distinguish it's only when you haven't called your code in enough time or you're on a brand new instance. So if you remember, like if I call my code once and call it again like five minutes later, the second time I call it, we already have that instance ready. It's got your code in it. You're, gonna get, you're not going to hit steps one and two of what Eduardo showed. Uh, so you're not going to hit cold start every time. It's just if things have gone idle or you're on a brand new instance that you'll hit that cold start. Yeah. So what I have here is a, is a, it's a, it's a function. Let's see if I, um, I have the code here, but um, search real quick. Um, I can show you what, what this is bringing, but it's pretty much this zip file here. Just open the folder. Um, so it's 30 megs uh, that's in this, in this function app here. And it has, let's see how many files it has has 15,000 files, and it's an actual app that uh, we found somewhere. So it's a lot of stuff to, to bring down into access for your code to run. So while Jeff was talking, I hit send to see how bad code start was. I didn't run this thing since before lunch or something, so this instance was code. And then I have one other app here um, with an Easter egg here with the function name. Do you want to read? Number 10 rocks, right, Jeff? Okay. So anyway, so this one is, um, should be quicker, has the improvements we have. You can see this one is running. It's, it has been at least one minute, I think, it's running. Once it's done, Postman is going to show us here um, the duration of this request. And this other one has the improvements um, we've made. So this one is 12 seconds. And this other one, it's um, 99 seconds. So. Close to like a 10x, 10x improvement we made just using run from zip. Um, and it's very easy for you to use. Um, actually, if you use Visual Studio Code, we deploy in that zip format for you, so you don't have to worry about it. I'm just explaining the technology. But if you deploy to different methods, you can set a environment variable, website, use zip, that's documented if you search run from zip, um, set to the location where you have your, your code files in zip format. Or you can store the files with your functions in the local file system of your functions and point, point to that as well. So it runs in these two modes, but it's a feature that we're going to make the default. So nobody has to really suffer from real bad code start. So it's one, one of the improvements we're making. We're making a bunch of improvements in this front. So super excited to show the improvements. All right, we got, we got time for one more tip, but we have three more. So do we do hybrid boats or uh, runtime? Uh, let's do runtime for sure. OK, uh, then we can go straight go. to that one. We could try it. We, I might be able to do this one fast. Let's go ahead and give this one a shot. Okay. I'll, be, I'll give you enough time for runtime. OK, so very quickly, I just want to give one tip, my last tip, on designing for high scale. And I have another analogy here. I'm going to be pretty brief here. So imagine a world where you have two cities, city one and city two, and they're separated by some body of water. And you've got like 1,000 people in city A, and they all need to get over to city B. But you just have one boat, and it's like a 10-foot boat. Now, the question that you have to answer is, how many people do you want to put in the boat every time that it goes from one spot to another? You could only put one person. You know they'll be totally safe. But you're going to have to make a lot of round trips. And if you try to put 1,000 people in that boat, the boat's probably going to tip over. Now, even if you had multiple boats, like let's say you had three or four boats, you still need to make sure that you understand what's the right amount of people for the size of boat that I have here so that things don't tip over, but I can get everybody over to the next city as quickly as possible. Now, the reason I tell you that beautiful story is because the same decision has to be made when you're writing with Azure Functions. So as your application has very high volumes, like if you're sending number of thousands of events every second, we're going to be scaling out to actually multiple instances, multiple virtual machines, all working to do your work. Okay? And we do the scaling automatically for you. It's serverless. That's great. But the part that you need to be aware of 
is on a single instance, you do have some fixed resources. You have a gig and a half of memory and one core CPU. And so you need to sometimes give us a hint so that we don't put too many people in a single boat and things start running out of memory or out of CPU. Because sometimes one message just represents add A plus B, but other times one message might represent some really complex and heavy lifting. So while we do our best effort to make sure that we're putting people in the right number of instances, there is this file called the host.json file. It's almost this secret file that you see in your projects, but you don't even really know what it does. This is the file that lets you decide how many executions in parallel you want one instance to handle. And there's trade-offs there, right? If you make this massive, if you say process 60 events in parallel per instance, you might be overwhelming the memory or CPU. But if you only say one, and maybe we've only scaled out to six or seven instances, it might take a little bit longer to get through all your messages. So this host.json file can be super useful for you to help us understand how many events should we push to a single instance at one time so that we're not putting too many people in the boat. Okay, so that's the tip. Hopefully that's helpful. And with that, Eduardo, take us home. Awesome. We excluded number 13 because that would be unlucky, I guess. Um, that's right. And one thing I want to clarify, because this is probably after the code start, that's probably the second most common question, which is, when should I use the V1 versus V2 runtime? And I have a little bit of the technical explanation on how they differ. So the V1s that are general availability runtime, if you have production workload, continue to use V1. Um, and that's where you have C Sharp, F Sharp, JavaScript, and a bunch of experimental languages. Um, which we do not recommend for production. Um, and, and if you're using proxies in a production, production manner, that's where you want to go. Now, the, um, and I'll talk about when to use V2. So V2, um, if, you wanna, if you, your dev environment is not Windows, you need V2 locally for you to do it with a Mac or Linux. If you're going to host in the cloud, in, and we have a Linux uh, hosting offering, um, you need to use V2 as well. And really, a lot of our upcoming development is going on V2. V2 is really the direction we're going to go. We, we're at, we had a job on V2. Um, if you're in the other serverless session we had yesterday, we showed Python working in a container that's in V2 as well. So a lot of our future investments in V2. Actually, it's a, it's a better architecture, it's a better model, make tons of improvements. In V1, which is the one you see at the top, you have a single host process that has our host, the functions host, which runs on .NET framework, and you have your function code that runs all in the same process. Um, if something goes wrong in the host or your code, the whole process goes down. So we, we don't isolate your code from our platform. On V2, the main change we made is our host is now .NET Core, so now it's cross-platform. Um, and if your code is Node.js, Java, any of the new programming languages, we actually have a separate process. We call it language worker process. And we'll communicate with your code using the gRPC protocol. Um, the only exception to that model is if you have a .NET app, we still run on the same process. For now, we want to experiment with .NET also running out of proc. But this gives you a different level of isolation. Also allows for us to not have to bring all the different languages with you when you don't need them. It's very rare the case that you do really cross language on the same function app. So, so that's a much better model architecture we're going with. Um, I know a lot of people get excited and we, if you're dev enthusiastic, definitely use V2. And it's, it's where we're going to move forward and hopefully in a few months we're going to be GA in it. Um, yep. So, so that's, that's sort of when to use which, which platform. OK, so in 30 seconds, and we'll do a refresher, we have our judges here. Here's our 13 tips. I'll give you five seconds to pick your favorite, and then we'll wrap it up with some stuff. And uh, so let's go ahead. There's, you don't even remember who gave which ones. But if you're on these first two rows, if you want to go ahead now and hold up the number of fingers for your favorite tip now, OK? All right. All right, all right, all right, all right. I think the winner is very close. There's actually a lot of really good ones. I think the winner is number seven, the resource utilization across executions. I, I thought I saw Don't count it. I Don't count I, I again. It's number seven. 
Okay. Um, all right. No, so thank you very much. So those were all some tips for us as well. This was rigged it. because Jeff was talking to some people I beforehand. I did no such rigging. Giving them stickers or something. But um, So just to wrap up uh, quickly here, um, and um, this is the best takeaway image I could find. But anyways, <laughs> so... We, we keep investing heavily on serverless across all the products. We're in the Azure Functions team, but Event Grid, Logic Apps, Cosmos DB, you name it. And it's really ready for you and for you to put more scenarios into it. And as you can see, we're, we're working hard through, through some advancements to make it even better in your experience. Um, it's in your choice which design you go with, which architecture that combines those services, and which tooling. Hopefully, we gave you some guidance to know which tools you, want to, you should use. Um, if you're enthusiastic about the product, try new features, give us feedback. We're open source, we're on GitHub. A lot of what we do is truly based on customer feedback and what we hear through the different channels on GitHub, user voice, Stack Overflow. Actually, the dev team competes on who answers more Stack Overflow and gets more stars. So we're really, really passionate about customer feedback. Um, to give an example, some of our functions, some of our functionality, like durable functions, we had more contributors that were external to our team than our own team. So we really work, appreciate the community Absolutely. chipping in and making the platform evolve. So big thank you to all of you to being here and, and adding and keeping, keeping us improving all the time. These are more sessions on serverless. Um, you might be interested. Right after this one is actually a hard choice because there are uh, Three. Four different, se four actually, oh, four, different yeah. sessions, one at 4.30 and three at 4.45. So I want to make a recommendation. The workshop is with Jeff, so if you want to continue working with Jeff and build something, that's uh, the workshop. It's a lab, so like you'll actually be building stuff, if that's interesting. So that, that's interesting. The, if you like the diagnostics part that I talked about, uh, that's the Azure has your back. Identity security, um, authentication, authorization, MSI. Uh, there's a tutor session that Matthew is going to deliver. Um, anyways, and all of those sessions we recommend, watch them offline. Tomorrow, we have, we have a tutor session just on durable functions. We didn't even cover it today because I think it deserves its own slot. Um, and functions in Microsoft Graph as well. So check those sessions out. Uh, the one I'd mentioned too, I think it's actually the next slide. Uh, so Eduardo and I, we've, we love presenting these conferences. This is actually the first time that we've given this type of a format of a talk. And it's always a challenge with Build because we only, we only had one session to present. This was 200 level, I'm putting that in quotes. But we know that all of you come with expectations. We wanna give you useful information. We wanna make sure that this is the right content for you at the right level. Sometimes we just do kind of marketing material. Other times we're just showing demos. This time we tried to give you like tips and tricks that are actually gonna make it useful. But that same time, we'd never done this before. So please, honestly, Give feedback, uh, and I'm not even just saying give like great feedback, like obviously we love good feedback, but give us feedback to help us so that when you come back hopefully next year, when we do this at Ignite or Inspire, whatever else, we wanna make sure that we're sharing the type of content that's going to make you the most productive and it's answering your questions as well. Uh, so please do take some time to fill out some evaluations. And uh, the other only note I would make too is we'll hang out here. I've gotta run to my lab in about five minutes, but we'll hang out up here up front to answer some questions if you have them. Uh, and if not, we've got our booth at the Expo Center, too, that either us will be at or someone from our team the whole week. Is that it? Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs>